Welcome everyone to our weekly market review. Today is the 8th of January. As usual, I have my co-host here, Mr. Gerald Wong with me. Gerald, how is your first week of 2024 going? Well, um, it was fairly hectic. Um, so starting the year, I had to look at various economic developments that came out in the past week. Uh, there was an investor fair last Saturday as well. So lots will actually be catching up on. Uh, and I think maybe because the engine also hasn't fully started uh, after the December break. So it took a bit of time to adjust back to having to go back to work again. Yes, I totally agree there. In the first week of uh, January, we already saw the first uh, non-farm payroll data, the big major news that come in. And on the Singapore side as well, we do have some a uh, few big companies uh, having some developments over there. So will you bring us through what happened last week? Okay, so that is what I will share in today's weekly market review. Um, as usual, today's sharing is for information purposes only, and we should not be taking whatever to be shared to be financial advice. Um, if you find the session helpful, uh, do leave us a review on Google, either by scanning this QR code or by going to the website. And if you want to be asking Sunny and myself questions after the weekly market review, uh, we actually have an ASEA session that is coming up on a monthly basis. And to join the ASEA session, uh, you can consider joining us as a member. Again, either by scanning this QR code or by going to the website. Uh, the sales membership only costs $12 per year, which will work out to $1 per month. Okay, so we started the year uh, with losses across the global markets. So not a very good start to 2024 from a stock market perspective. Uh, S&P 500 was down by 1.5% and back to below the 4,700 levels. Uh, the losses were led by the tech stock. So we saw NASDAQ down by 3.2%. Uh, if you are an Apple shareholder, you probably have seen quite a bit of weakness in the share price of Apple last week as well. So what we saw is the tech stocks actually losing some of the gains that they made towards the end of 2023. Uh, closer to home, we saw the STI also correcting back to below the 3,200 levels. Uh, if you joined the weekly market review last week, uh, you have recorded Sunny actually sharing that uh, the STI saw very strong gains towards the last two weeks of 2023. So as we enter 2024, uh, we are starting to see some of these gains actually reversing. So what was it that actually caused this uh, weakness in the stock markets? Uh, Sunny mentioned that there were the US farm uh, non-farm payroll data that was out last week. Uh, but throughout the week, there were various signs that uh, the Fed might not be cutting interest rates as quickly as what the market is expecting. So, for example, the latest minutes that came out from the Fed meeting actually had some signs that, oh, there might be uh, the indication that interest rates might not be cut as quickly uh, because if inflation actually remains high, then there isn't a need to bring down uh, the interest rates at such a rapid pace. So what we saw is the likelihood of a rate cut in March actually came down. Okay, so this is once again from the CME Fed Watch 2. Uh, if I were to look at one week ago, okay, the expectations for the likelihood of a March rate cut was actually above 70%. Okay, uh, so if I were to look at where it was over the weekend, then that has fallen to just slightly above 60%. So because of the Fed minutes that came out, uh, because of the non-farm payroll data that indicated that the jobs market in the US remains strong, uh, we have actually seen investors moderating their expectations of a rate cut in the March meeting. Okay, and what we also see would be a bounce in the government bond yields. Okay, so this is the US government bond yield uh, for the 10-year bond. Uh, what we see here is, if you recall what I shared in the previous weekly market review, uh, it has fallen below 4%, uh, from above 5% just in late October. Uh, but just last week, we saw it rebounding to... Uh, above 4% once again, 
due to the various economic data that has come out. Okay, so that effectively explains some of the weakness in the tech stocks uh, because of this bounce in the US government bond yields once again. Okay, closer to home, we also saw the release of the 2023 uh, GDP data. Uh, the good news is that Singapore's economy grew by 1.2% in 2023. So that is slightly above um, the expectation that it will come in just at about 1%. A uh, big part of this uh, stronger than expected numbers really came through from the rebound in the manufacturing sector towards the later part of 2023. Uh, looking into 2024, the expectation is that our economy will grow in the range of 1% to 3%. So that is slightly accelerating from the growth that we saw last year. Okay, so in terms of the top performers for the STI last week, uh, not a lot of gainers in the STI uh, given the fall in the market. Uh, but we saw two stocks actually having a fairly strong start to 2023. Uh, the first is Yang Zijiang Shipbuilding, which I will talk a bit more of later. Uh, next, we also have Thai Beverage, which was one of the worst performing stocks in 2023, actually having a bit of rebound uh, due to improved sentiment towards the Thai consumer sector, as well as some of the change in regulations uh, towards beverage sale in Thailand. Uh, thereafter, we have got some names, Semcom Industries, Venture, Capital, um, outperforming the STI, but still um, either staying flat or with slight losses in the past week. Okay, in terms of the worst performers, uh, we saw a few stocks that didn't have such a good start to 2024. Uh, Citrum was down by 4.2%, uh, Imperador down by 4.7%. So, uh, in opposite direction to what we saw for Thai Bev. Uh, Singtel down by 4.9%, uh, DFI Retail Group down by 5%, and Capital Land Investment down by 5.1%. Okay, So uh, quite a number of these stocks actually uh, having fairly sizable losses just within one week. Okay, so uh, I will go through two stocks today, uh, Yang Zetel Shipbuilding and Citrum. Uh, since those are two stocks that saw fairly sizable movements in the past week, and they are also names that we get asked about often by retail investors. Okay, so I'll start by Citrum. Uh, what we see here is um, the correction in the share price in September last year. Uh, it had a bit of rebound towards late 2023, uh, but then having this loss as we start 2024. Okay, so there were actually two big news for Citrum that came out last week, uh, which I thought was worth talking about. So first and foremost, we saw that they had a contract that was cancelled by their customer. So this is a 250 million wind farm contract by a client called Empire Offshore Wind, uh, which is a joint venture between the Norwegian state-owned energy company Equinor, as well as oil giant BP. So the reason for the contract cancellation is that um, the customer cited significant macroeconomic conditions that impacted the project. Okay, so we'll understand what are some of these significant macroeconomic conditions later, but it is important uh, because it's been quite a while since we saw a contract cancellation for Citrum, um, and that is something that might have been of concern to investors. Uh, but it isn't all bad news for Citrum in the past week. We also saw that they announced that it has won a contract by Shell to be constructing a deep water new build project. Uh, so this is in the oil space uh, and it follows a letter of intent that was signed in August last year. And maybe because the letter of intent was already signed last year and this is a confirmation of the contract. So that might be why the share price didn't see that much of a bounce after the announcement last week. Okay, so as a recap uh, for Citrum, if you realize you have got two news, one relating to the conventional oil and gas sector and then the other one relating to a wind farm project. So it is important to realize that for Citrum now, it is not just an oil and gas equipment company, but it also has got a sizable offshore renewable and new energy segment. Okay, 
So uh, if you are wondering what it does within this segment, so involved in things like offshore wind, equipment, construction, uh, other things like new energy, including carbon capture, uh, and ways to be able to extract greener oil and gas. Okay, so uh, if you are to look at the order book of Citrum, uh, it effectively reached a high of about 20 billion in March after the merger with Kepler Offshore and Marine. But over the past two quarters, uh, the order book for Citrum has been coming down uh, and as of September 2023, it is at 17.7 .7 billion. So with the news of the order cancellation, uh, that would have definitely dampened sentiment for Citrum further uh, because that may mean that if it is unable to get significant new orders to replace um, the cancellation, then we might actually see a further decline in the order book. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that the client cited uh, macroeconomic uh, conditions that actually led to their decision to cancel the contract. So what is this macroeconomic situation that we are looking at? So we have been talking a lot about interest rates over the past few weekly market review. Uh, and it is important to realize that the higher interest rates not just impact ourselves in terms of the higher mortgage that we need to pay or what is the higher yield that we are able to get on the treasury bill. But for companies, it affects the decision to go ahead with particular projects as well. Okay, so this is the financing rate for wind farm projects. So to be able to say uh, build a wind farm, you might decide to borrow some money from the bank to be able to finance this project. So what we see here is that when some of these projects were actually decided uh, back in 2020 and 2021, the interest rates were still at very low levels, actually close to 0% back then. Uh, but what we have seen and realized over the past 12 months is that interest rates have gone up very significantly. So that would have impacted whether a project is still viable and whether the customer still wants to go ahead with this project. Okay, So it is important to realize that this is how the higher interest rates can affect companies as well. So this is effectively how the higher interest rates affect the company's decision to actually go ahead with a project. Okay, so using this example, which is a US offshore wind, um, how much it actually costs uh, to actually produce the energy on a per megawatt hour basis. Uh, if you look at 2021, uh, this data from Bloomberg, it was actually at about $77, okay? Uh, but what we have seen over the last two years is that the capex and opex costs have increased. Okay, uh, we have seen massive inflation over the past two years, and we have seen wage increases as well. So that will have led to an increase in operating expense for any company that is running a wind farm. Uh, but more significantly, we have seen the very sharp spike in interest rates. Uh, so that would translate to a higher financing cost for the project. Um, so effectively, this is the additional $27 that would come through uh, from producing an additional megawatt hour of wind energy. So even if you've got some additional bonus tax credits that are coming through, uh, it will still lead to a higher uh, cost of producing the wind energy. So because of this higher operating cost, because of this increase in financing cost, uh, it might have led the customer to actually decide not to go ahead with the project anymore. Okay, So it is important for us to realize that the environment that we are in now is different because of the higher interest rates. And that is why when we often get asked what is the one thing to keep a lookout for in 2024, it always goes back to the interest rate once again. Okay, so that is for Citrum. Uh, the other stock I wanted to talk about today is Yang Zijiang Shipbuilding that we saw earlier um, defied the losses in the STI and was the top gainer in the past week. Okay, so what effectively happened is that uh, we have improved sentiment towards stocks in the shipping and shipbuilding sector uh, because we saw a very sharp spike 
in the container shipping rates or freight rates. Okay, so effectively now bouncing to above uh two thousand five hundred per uh uh unit of this particular shipping rate okay so that is actually a sharp increase compared to where we were at end 2023 okay so if you have actually been following the news you have seen a lot of headlines around the red sea uh, and how there have been various incidents at the red sea uh, that is actually disrupting this major shipping route okay so if you are not familiar with where the red sea is uh here's actually a uh, map that might help you to understand it a bit better. Uh, so effectively, it is near the Swiss Canal, uh, which is an important shipping route. And based on the statistics that I saw, uh, effectively, you have got about uh, 10 plus percent of the global trade that actually goes through this uh, shipping route. And if I'm looking at container traffic in particular, then it actually accounts for about 30% of the entire container shipping traffic. Okay, so uh, if the shipping companies need to divert from this shipping route because of the incidents that are happening there, um, if there's going to be any disruption, uh, it will naturally lead to a spike in the shipping rates. Okay, so what has happened as a result is that uh, shipping rates have spiked across all the different routes, uh, whether is it from Shanghai to Rotterdam, Shanghai to Los Angeles, um, across all the routes because of the diversion that we are seeing away from the Red Sea, um, the container freight rates have actually gone up very sharply over the past week. Okay, so uh, this is something that has actually led to improved sentiment for Yang Zhejiang shipbuilding. Um, effectively, we have already seen that in the first half of 2023, uh, the company has been able to report higher revenue and profit because of the higher shipbuilding order book that it has. And I think what investors are hoping is that with the higher container freight rates, that might translate into more shipbuilding orders for the company. Okay, so if you look at the order book that Yang Zhejiang has, uh, container ships are a big part of its order book. Uh, it's got 91 container ships in its order book as of June 2023. Uh, and this makes up a big part of its entire order book. Okay, so this is something that has grown quite significantly, especially if you compare to 31st December 2020 and has explained why the order book has reached a very high level of 14.7 billion compared to 3.1 billion just about two and a half years ago. Okay, so what to look out for in the week ahead? Uh, if you want to understand more about Singtel, hear directly from the management team. Uh, do join our CIAS Corporate Connect with Singtel tomorrow. Uh, we want to be having a very lively and engaging conversation with the management of Singtel and understand what we can look forward to in the year ahead. Uh, I mentioned that uh, we need to look out for the interest rate uh, trends very closely and linked to that, uh, the US CPI data is coming out on 11th of Jan. So that's something that will provide another data point as to whether or not the Fed will cut interest rates in March or later on this year. Uh, we also have the earnings season coming up very quickly uh, with the US banks reporting. So this Friday, we have got JP Morgan, City Bank of America actually starting the earnings season. And that is something that investors will keep a lookout for to understand the health of the US economy. Okay, so quite a number of things to look out for. And with that, I'll hand over to Sunny to keep us updated around how we can understand the technical indicators in the market. Uh, over to you, Sunny. Okay, thanks Gerald for the insightful sharing and thanks for reminding that it's only the second week of 2024 and we are looking at the start of the earnings seasons already. And yes, this week uh, we are looking at the CPI data coming out from US as well as Japan and China. So I believe there will be a lot of movements uh, on the markets from those data over there. Uh, but before I go to the charts, I would like to touch on the, uh, the Fed minutes and then the projection of where interest rate might be heading. 
So according to the dot plot chart, we are looking at consensus of uh, for 2024 uh, among the Fed committee members. The target rate is looking at slightly above 4.5%, so it's around 4.75. So we are expecting at least a three uh, 25 basis point cut this year to reach the 4.75% level. Of course, before this, there's a lot of news and uh, projections from a lot of uh, top investment bank saying that we might be seeing 7 to 9 uh, 25 basis point cut this year. And that is also the reason why I believe the market uh, has already front run themselves. And the data that came in last week, the ADP employment data, as well as the non-farm payroll data sort of uh, push back those kind of expectation. And that's why there's a slight pullback in the market to set things into perspective that the earliest cut we would likely see would likely be in uh, March of this year. So looking at the probability table, okay. So definitely the Friday non-farm data with the strong numbers as well as the ADP numbers are also coming in very strong. Uh, there is that, uh, unlikely any chances of us seeing a rate cut in the month of January. So that is why the percentage now uh, of an unchanged kind of decision is still at 95%. Uh, the next rate decision we would have is on 20th of uh, March. And this number now stands at uh, 60%. And it has been fluctuating around the 70 to 60% level in the uh, first week of uh, January. So it came down from the 70% to the 60% after the strong job numbers came in last week. So the chances of us seeing a rate cut in March, it's slightly lower now between 60% uh, to, to about 61% level. So this number will still change along the way as we get more data, especially the inflation number that's going to come out this week. This, the, the, uh, the probability will likely change. So do keep a lookout on how, how this number changes according to the CPI data that's coming out this week. Okay, to the charts. Okay, so this is the STI chart uh, for the second week of 2024 this morning STI opened uh, a bit uh, high and now it is uh, more or less likely flat around the close to the 10 o'clock timing okay so last week we touched on where the support zone might be so this orange uh, highlighted area here which was what I covered would likely be the support zone that I'm looking at so um, so market do have the same view as I am so after last week we saw that the market came down on Friday, there was a bit of a bounce because we started to test the support level around the support that we see on 4th of October. So that's why you can see that the bounce is over here. However, having said that, this is a support level, but then the resistance level, I'm still looking at the high in December, which is around the 3,250 points level. So looking at how much upside we have over here from the current 3,187 level, I think it's still a limited upside and I don't think the risk and reward ratio is in our favor yet. Hence, I still think uh, it's not the time to go in yet to go long for the STI index. Uh, the indicators sort of confirm that view also. You can see that the MACD histogram is uh, sliding downwards. The MACD line and the signal lines are converging towards each other, meaning that the uptrend that we see earlier in December has been uh, losing momentum already and is likely not going to push up much higher. So that means that uh, although we still have a positive number, but that kind of a positive momentum is, is weakening already. And the RSI earlier have already breached the 70 point overbought mark and we have pulled back in the first week of uh, January and now we are hovering around the 58 point level which is very close to the 50 point neutral mark thereby signaling to us again that uh, momentum is uh, slightly weak as well although it's still a positive number. So we can still see that uh, STL hover around this level of about 3,200 points level but uh, the risk and reward ratio or the trade setup now is not really in our favor yet. So just to recap a bit, last year on the STI index, I indicated this support zone over here on the STI index and of course some position in on the long side, but market was, um, market uh, do tested our patients quite a bit for a long time and only until December, I only see that profit number and close the position over here. So that is, uh, that is the, the patience that we need to have for markets to come down to our level to according to go, go to our plan of our trade setup before we get back in on a safer position. So for now, I believe uh, this is the support level, but I do not think that this is the ideal trade setup that we should have. I'm looking at it at least pulling back below the uh, below the 50 days moving average, I believe, which is the blue color moving average that you see over here. And that's around the 3,142 points level. Okay, so below one three one five zero, would then uh, I would start to look up at, on the STI index to see 
where are the possible uh, zones that I can get in around the SCI index. So for now, although this is a support, but I'm not going to go in, I'm going to let it test the 3150, the 50 days moving average before I decide uh, whether to go on for, to go on to go long on the SCI index. Now a bit on the 50 days moving average. So 20 days moving average is the short term moving average, which is where the prices follow very closely. 50 point level is uh, somewhere uh, technical traders look at uh, for a significant pullback to re-enter, to rejoin the uptrend. So that's also the reason why I'm looking at the 50 days moving average. If you go below that, the next one will be the amber line, which is the 100 days moving average, sort of where close to where we are at right now. And that is the what we call a pivot. If there's any change of trend, or whether we can close above or below the 100 days moving average, that is where uh, it will indicate if there's any change of trend uh, on, the, on the candlestick or the price movement. Okay, so STI for now, I would just say be patient and wait for the price to come down a little bit more before uh, taking some position on the STI index. Next, let's look at the US indices. Okay, so this is the Dow Jones index. As you can see, the first week of uh, January, not much of a movement. The red candle was due to the Fed minutes and then followed by the, uh, the employment data that comes in in the final two days of last week. So market was uh, not really uh, moving a lot. So it is still uh, pretty much elevated, like I said earlier. And market might have front run themselves. And now we are uh, on a very kind of a high valuation, I would say, and even higher than both the... Uh, the moving average that we see on the Dow Jones index at least. So now this is a very high uh, high level that we are looking at. And if you look at the indicators, the MACD indicator has started to trend down already. The MACD line has crossed below the signal line and the MACD histogram has turned negative. So meaning now that there is uh, there's more negative momentum into the Dow Jones index and that negative momentum looks set to be... Um, get a bit more aggressive because the, of the widening or the divergence of the signal line and the uh, MACD line. If it gets wider, that means the downtrend momentum is going to gain momentum towards the downside. And the next support that you'll be looking at, 50 days moving average, like I said, would be, the, would be one of the points that uh, a lot of traders will be looking at at around the uh, 36,106 point level. And just below that, you can see this bold blue line over here, which was a mini double top in September that would uh, provide further support. And that would also means that we would have retest the uh, the 100 days moving average, which is the amber line that you see over here at 35,319 points. So I think the US indices, including the Dow Jones index, are staying on a pretty elevated level right now. And I do, if you do have any long position on the US index, it would be good to consider taking some profit off the table to wait for a pullback uh, before getting in on the Dow Jones index again. And that uh, really depends on uh, at least for this week, really be, depends on what is the inflation numbers that we are going to see, whether the disinflation trend is going to continue further. Okay, on the S&P 500 index, which is one of the big winners uh, in 2024, gaining about 24%. So you can see the S&P 500 has pulled back more significantly as com uh, compared to the Dow Jones index. And as you can see, the MACD indicator turned negative already. And uh, one of the... The um, reading that we can use on the MACD indicator is where the zero baseline is. Usually, on the once the uh, MACD line or signal line cross above or below the zero baseline, it will means that uh, the momentum is uh, going to be uh, at the peak, and that momentum can either be a upside momentum or a downside momentum depending whether we are crossing from the top or the bottom. So as you can see previously, once uh, in the October rally that we see through December last year. Once we have a crossover of the MACD above the signal line, you can see that the rally started to go all the way. And then once it crossed the zero baseline, the rally will extend further. So this is the opposite that we are looking at right now. We have seen the crossover of the MACD line below the signal line uh, at the beginning of the year. And now this uh, downside momentum is actually accelerating downwards. And that is the zero baseline would be somewhere that we need to watch. Okay, then the RSI indicator now reading at 55. So five points above the neutral mark. We crossed the 70 point overbought level in December and hence uh, the, it says that the market is in an overbought position and we have come down to the neutral mark right now. So this is uh, this is telling us that we are either forecasting, the, the indicators are telling us that the market has negative momentum right now or the RSI is telling us that most likely it's a neutral kind of uh, situation going on for the momentum reading. 
So not a lot of upside to look at on the S&P 500 at this moment, but then we have to be careful of the downside. So wait for a pullback further to the 50 days or the 100 days moving average before we re-look at it to see whether it's time to go for a long position. And the, uh, the earnings seasons will also help us to give us an insight of how the, uh, the markets or the corporates are, are doing uh, to the first earnings seasons of this year. Lastly, let's look at the Nasdaq Composite Index, which had the biggest drop last week. So you can see that after the uh, non-farm payroll data, it is uh, more or less a dash any hopes that we will see a rate high early. And these highly leveraged uh, tech companies or Nasdaq Composite uh, co uh, composite companies has the, mo has the most of the pullbacks, including the Apple stocks uh, that uh, Gerald touched on just now. So needless to say, the indicators are, are negative and the... Uh, RSI has crossed below the 50-point neutral mark. That means the, the, weak, the weakness in the Nasdaq Composite Index is really very strong right now. And we are close to the 50 days moving average already. And probably we may we have we will have test this level. And probably we, we may be able to see it test the 100 days moving average at 13,969 points. That would mean that it's a more of a 500 point drop that we are expecting. And that would test the 14,000 handle, which I believe is a psychological level that traders would want to look out for. So direction of the Nasdaq Composite Index definitely going down further. Uh, where is the support line going, going to come in? I'm just looking at the 100 days moving average, which is a pivot point level that I talked about earlier. If it's getting close above this 100 days moving average, the amber line that you see here, then I think the uptrend that we see in December will likely continue. However, if this uh this if we are we close below this 100 days moving average, then I will see that uh, the downtrend that we see since the early part of uh, January will likely continue downwards. And then the 200 days moving average will become the critical level to look at for the NASDAQ Composite Index, which would be a very attractive level to get back in on the NASDAQ Composite Index. Okay, so that is uh, my take on the market uh, this week. Any final words for us, Gerald? Hi, uh, I think basically we have got quite a busy week ahead. Uh, we have got the CPI data that will effectively set the direction for the market in the coming weeks. We have got the start of the earnings season as well. So I think those are the things that we'll continue to keep a very close lookout for to actually understand how the markets will actually move in the next few weeks, whether the declines that we saw in the first week will actually extend into the rest of January or whether we'll actually continue to see the uptrend, like what we saw towards the end of December. Yep, so do stay safe if you are trading into the market. Uh, this month is still early part of the year. We are still waiting a lot of a lot more of the data to come in after, as well as reflecting of what's happening last year. So that's all the time that we have for this week. So as usual, I want to thank Mr. Gerald for joining us today and for everyone who joined us uh, this afternoon on the second uh, weekly market review of this year. So as usual, if you find this session useful, do give us a like and a share and I will see you again next week in the next weekly market review.